Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Friday, September 8th, 2023. My guest today is a longtime friend of mine, but I believe this is her maiden appearance on Judging Freedom is retired Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski, uh, who in her years in the Air Force analyzed uh, intelligence for her colleagues and her superiors. Uh, Colonel Karen, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I have been here before and I love okay. it. <laughs> okay. My, my, my apology. We, we produce so much content and uh, I, my, my apology. You are always uh, welcome back. You are, of course, a friend and collaborator of some of the regulars on the show, like Larry Johnson uh, and Ray, uh, Ray McGovern. Do you uh, sense uh, cracks uh, in the uh, cohesion of the Ukrainian military? Do you sense a sort of public awareness that notwithstanding this over-propagandized war, mm -hmm. um, that the people who are making observations of what's happening there have come to the conclusion this can't go on much longer. Uh, yeah, and we've been seeing that for a while, actually. But I think most recently with some of the uh, uh, firings or uh, vacation of office of uh, some of the military leadership in Ukraine, it's telling us that it's even getting this sense of reality is is dawning on even the higher levels. And um, when you combine that with what's going on here with our ability to continue to uh, send unlimited amounts of uh, weaponry in there, uh, that's stopping, that's ending. Uh, you know, I think, I think everybody's kind of getting the same picture now. How much longer do you think uh, the war party in Congress, which is about 90% of everybody in Congress, there are some, you know, uh, progressives on the left and some of our friends, libertarians uh, on the right, who don't want to have anything to do with war, but the overwhelming majority of both parties and certainly the White House, how much more do you think they will allow themselves to be deluded by the propaganda that comes out of mainstream media, including my uh, former employer? Well, that's a good question uh, because they're really late to the reality game in the case of Ukraine. Um, even from the beginning, information has been available for anyone who wants to uh, look at it and assess it uh, and check it out. That information has been out there that this whole thing is kind of a, a drama game rather than a real uh, combat situation. This is, I mean, it's there's combat, but this whole thing was created uh, for entirely different purposes uh, than what we've been led to believe. And th that information has been out there. So why Fox News, why uh, the mainstream media is still still so eager to carry the water for this administration uh, and the neocons, I, I don't really know. I think maybe like, you know, they're not very good reporters. They've lost the, the skill of um, actually being reporters and they really are an arm of the government. Uh, you know, captured by the same people that own most of our Congress, the military industrial complex. And, you know, their hand, they feel like their hands are tied. And, and really, when people do speak out, they are taken off of mainstream media. I mean, we, we still see that very consistently. Well, people like you and McGovern and, um, and Johnson and Colonel McGregor, your colleague, and Scott Ritter, they can't get on mainstream media. They come on here. You know, we have millions of viewers for which I am uh, deeply and profoundly grateful every single day. Uh, but quite uh, frankly, uh, the the mainstream media has a bigger uh, megaphone. But the, the, do you agree that this is probably the most propagandized war in modern history? I mean, you and I remember uh, Vietnam, where the media was on the other side and the media challenged the government at every conceivable turn. Walter Cronkite flew to Vietnam him. Yeah. himself. And when he came home, LBJ said, man, if I've lost Con Cronkite, I've lost the country. It doesn't happen today. No, no, we, we don't have uh, any independence. And we really haven't for many years. I mean, the first invasion of Iraq when uh, CNN made its bones, you know, in the, the uh, you know, the, the uh, basically tracking the war and watching the things blow up and celebrating that, uh, that was not reporting. Uh, that was government media at work. And we've had that for 30 years now at least. Um, that's let's, what we're dealing with. Let's take, uh, as an example, the uh, destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. <laughs> I mean, Seymour Hersh beat everybody to the punch. 
He yes, he interviewed did. people that were involved in the preparation for it. He viewed the emails and texts that they sent to each other. He did everything short of naming names. And the mainstream media says, oh, it was two guys in a sailboat. Here's a picture of the sailboat. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, you know, at some point, um, you know, the truth does win out, uh, even in small ways. And, uh, you know, nobody who challenged uh, Seymour Hersh's um, reporting was able to produce any documentation of what they were saying. And Seymour Hersh is very well documented. And, of course, that's characteristic of him. And uh, he has credibility. And also, too, America may not matter as much as we as Americans think it does. You know, your global audience uh, really gets it and they they do understand this. And there's a much there's so many of them that see this from a, a very clear eyed perspective of uh, of national interests and, and the American national interest, as communicated by the Biden administration and the neocons, is well understood by the rest of the world. They don't appreciate it. But right. they do understand what it is. And I think that allows them to be a little more clear eyed than than we Americans can be. When you were uh, in the Air Force, uh, you worked with uh, intelligence officers. You received their data it was one of your jobs was to analyze it. How do you think they feel <laughs> when their raw data, their raw analysis, which is objective, is turned around subjectively and fed to the president or whoever receives this stuff in the White House uh, in a manner that the that the feeder thinks the recipient wants to hear it. The truth be damned. Yeah. How do the you think the people who risk their lives to collect the truth feel about what's done with what they collect, if you follow me? Well, yeah, and I do. And I think they're very angry. And I know what I saw in uh, 20 in 2002, 2003, extreme anger. Um, and that anger led to very little because uh, even the intelligence officers at the senior SES level would be replaced immediately if they complained about what was being done, the politicization of, of the information uh, in order to pursue a very particular agenda that, you know, people that understand uh, kind of our country and what's important. And I'm not saying everybody knows the right answer, but many of these intelligence guys, they are patriots. And when they see their hard work, their honest work being used for stuff that really is harming this country in the long term. And I don't think there's any doubt that the politicization of our intelligence from you pick the year, you pick the decade, it harms our country. It weakens our country. It uh, divides our country. Um, it's wrong. It's harmful. It's expensive, of course. And they feel this way and they're upset about it. And I, I honestly don't see how anyone would, would serve in the Pentagon today uh, in any important job uh, because it is a betrayal. It's a betrayal. If you don't have control, if you're not able to support the Constitution in the daily work that you do, you don't need to be there. And right now, I don't think they can. Well, it, it's hard for me to believe. And, you know, I, I have made a living out of this, mm -hmm. um, that the, the, the CIA has the slightest deference to the Constitution. I mean, they're just notoriously indifferent to human dignity. Uh, and to uh, the Fourth Amendment, finding as many holes as they can. They just don't care about it. You can't even mention CIA and search warrant in the same uh, sentence um, uh, if you're if you're in the CIA because they don't give a damn about the search warrant or the Fourth Amendment. They just spy on whomever they think they can, they can spy on. That's right. That's exactly right. And the, the growing domestic encroachment of the CIA and organizations connected with the CIA um, whether it's overseas organizations spying on us on behalf of our CIA or domestic organizations, it's, it's really, um, it's really horrendous. And I think we live in a post-constitutional era and the, the CIA is one big reason for that. Yes. Yes. We, we have a, a warfare state, a welfare state and a national security state and 90% uh, of the Congress just keeps Feeding it. I'm going to run a clip now of the neocon in chief, uh, Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken. This is just two days ago. I'd like your thoughts on it, Colonel. Uh, talking about uh, the offensive, the this is hard to say with a straight face. The Ukrainian offensive has made real progress. Well, I'll let him say it. In the years since I was last here, Ukraine has taken back more than 50 percent of the territory that Russia uh, has seized from it since February of 2022. In the current counteroffensive, 
we are seeing real progress over the last few weeks. Uh, as it happens, President Zelensky just returned from the front line, so I was able to hear directly from him his assessment uh, of the counteroffensive. And I think it very much matches our own, which is, as I said, real progress in, in recent weeks. Now, who can take that uh, seriously other than the mainstream media? Yeah. And Zelensky and Blinken can take it seriously. Um, I, I, it's, he looks somewhat embarrassed in, in speaking that way. Um, I imagine that the intelligence that Blinken is getting, uh, even from his own filtered neoconservative, uh, you know, propaganda factory, I think belies what he is saying. And I think he knows it. And I think it's, it's written on his face. Uh, this, it, I don't see how he keeps a straight face, honestly. Um, here, in fact, here, you're, people you're looking at see, maps can tell that it's not true. Yeah, you're going to see him again now, uh, claiming that the West is building a force uh, for the future and Ukraine is growing stronger because of uh, what the West is doing for it. I think you're going to see even less credibility in his eyes, but I'll let you evaluate, Colonel. It's critically important that we and many other countries that uh, have agreed to do the same help Ukraine build a force for the future, a military force for the future, that is capable of deterring future aggression and, if necessary, uh, defending and, and defeating it. We now have 29 countries that have signed on to a declaration issued by the G7 uh, at the end of the NATO summit uh, that is focused on doing just that, helping Ukraine build this force future. And we need President Putin to understand that he cannot outlast Ukraine, he cannot outlast Ukraine's supporters, that Ukraine is actually going to grow stronger and even more effective uh, with a military force that is world class, uh, but also a strong and vibrant economy and a strong and vibrant uh, democracy. So right next to uh, Secretary Blinken is his counterpart the foreign minister of uh, Ukraine, who could not look Secretary Blinken in the eye as he was saying that stuff. Oh, wow. I was wondering, I was wondering what the expression on his face uh, was as he listened to some of this. He looked um, like, uh, Karen, he looked like this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, you know, the Ukrainians have been led down a primrose path. Um, and the Americans, uh, the neocons who have no experience in war or strategy, and very little in uh, uh, positive, effective uh, foreign relations in any, I mean, they just don't have a track record. Um, you know, <laughs> these guys are not even believable uh, to the Ukrainians. And of course, the, that country has been laid up, you know, has been put out to dry. It's been destroyed in, in so many ways. Um, it went from a quasi-corrupt democracy to a basically military martial law dictatorship. It has lost, I don't know how many, uh, millions and millions of people, not just in the war, but people who have left and who are not coming back to Ukraine. And it's lost its Russian speaking uh, and somewhat productive agricultural uh, lands permanently. Those, those lands, it's permanent. It's a permanent loss. We already have a smaller Ukraine, both in numbers and territory, and certainly the economy is in, sh in shambles. So all of that has to be you know, what is it? We're helping you by wiping the slate clean and reducing your footprint as a nation. Uh, that's what we're doing for you. I mean, you know, Blinken, Blinken, is, it's a shame. It's just, it's just a shame. I mean, all of this because uh, the neocons, uh, Victoria Nuland, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, and I guess the vice pre uh, the president, you know, he wasn't always a neocon, but he is now. I uh, want to use Ukraine as a battering ram because they fancifully think crazily think mm -hmm. they can somehow drive Vladimir uh, Putin from office. Oh, sure. And and I don't think uh, they really understand what, well, I think you mentioned it. They don't understand Russia very well. They don't understand, they certainly don't understand Putin, but they haven't even studied the information that is out there uh, about what Russia is and how it looks and how it works and how it operates. And uh, even, ge you know, geographically, I'm not sure many of them uh, understood much about the geography of that area before they decided they're going to, you know, go up against and we're, we're going to displace Val Vlad Putin and have a have a new military market now that we had to leave Afghanistan so abruptly. Right. You know, right. I mean, uh, very short sighted and ill informed. Um, and this is what you get with politicized intelligence: you get bad decisions, mistakes, waste of life and and money. It's, it's sad. Here's. Um... 
my uh, friend and former colleague, uh, Tucker Carlson, interviewing uh, Victor Orban. It's a great uh, clip. It's maybe about uh, a minute long, and it's just what you're talking about, how the West does not understand Russian culture and how the West fails to examine Russia as Russia looks at itself. To understand the Russians, it's a difficult thing. So when we speak about politics, I, I mean Westerners, what is the focus point of our conversation? The focus point is freedom. How to provide more and more freedom to the people. When you speak on politics in Russia, this is not the number one issue. The number one issue, how to keep together the country. That's generate a different kind of culture and understanding of politics. That's create a, a kind of military approach, always on security, safety, buffer zone, geopolitical approaches. It's but we have to understand that we cannot beat them as we do just now. It's impossible. They will not kill their leader. They will never give it up. They will keep together the country and they will defend it. We finance more, they will invest more. If we send more technical equipment, they will produce more. So don't misunderstand the Russians. So they're not going to get sick of Putin and throw him out? <sighs> Come on, it's a joke. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think I think uh, Orban knows a lot more than we do. Um, and of course, you know, we don't listen to him in this country. Right. He's a boogeyman over here. That's right. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really important to understand. And the fantasy that the neocons have, um, it really is it really is fantasy. Uh, and I'm not sure, actually, that they don't really want to destroy things because their track record in their foreign policy has been very destructive. It's very much uh, let's let's blow things up, you know, creative destruction. Let's blow things up and then we'll see what happens and maybe we'll you know we'll make a little money and, and then we'll go on to a new project. That's that's their habit. Um, Do you, you know, think they have an off ramp? Do you think Joe Biden has an off ramp? Well, Joe Biden himself is very close to his, you know, normal expected lifespan off ramp. The poor man is uh, not in very good uh, shape. But the people that run this administration, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they're thinking because um, they do need to be planning for that off ramp. Um, right. I, this this the people in this country aren't going to pay for Ukraine anymore. And when and the people have already decided Congress needs to get that through its head. And I think it it kind of suspects this is the case. Um, you know, we have our own problems. America first is not a Trump statement. It is what everybody believes. Uh, how they define that may be one thing, but we want our money to stay here. We have limited amounts of it in the future. So that part's ending. And I think what the neocons want is a project. And again, uh, much like um, um, Mr. Blumenthal stated last uh, last Friday or last, yeah, last Friday, they want a little Israel, kind of a kind of a very prickly little security state that can experiment with uh, modern military weapons and crowd control techniques and um, kind of a martial law, permanent martial law kind of thing that we own and control. I think that's their off ramp. And mm. I think that is also like so many of their ideas is unrealistic. I think it'll be much, uh, it, won't, it won't end up that way. I think it's gonna end up a tragedy. It's a very interesting observation, Colonel. Very interesting. Here's um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Orban again saying Russia will win, and the neocons know it. And when they say Ukraine is going to win, they're not misspeaking or mistaken. They're lying. In the United States, the view is that Ukraine is winning this war. It doesn't sound like that's true. No, it's a lie. It's not just a misunderstanding. It's a lie. It's impossible. Everybody who's in politics and understand the logic, the figures, the data, no way. Why is it impossible? Because that way, the Ukrainian, the poor Ukrainians die every day. Yes. Hundreds and thousands, you know. So I'm, my heart is with them. It's tragedy for Ukraine. But they will run out earlier from the soldiers, number of soldiers, than the Russians. What finally will count is boots on the ground. And the Russians are far stronger far numerous, more numerous it is more than of Ukrainians. Them. Many more. So this strategy, what we are just supporting, is a bad engineering of the strategy. Wow. You yeah. don't hear that in the American uh, media. You know, Tucker and I are both uh, spent substantial careers at Fox. Fox is now is what it is, but 
mm -hmm. basically a mouthpiece like the mainstream media. This is what uh, CIA and MI6, not the people on the ground, but management, uh, want the media to tell everybody. Victor Orban is one of the few is saying otherwise. Before you respond, I'm going to play another uh, Victor Orban. It's just as profound, uh, Colonel. The U.S. can stop the war in 24 hours. Watch this. So if United States would like to have a peace, next morning there is a peace. Because it's obvious that the Ukrainians, the poor Ukrainians on their own, they are not competitive in this war. So if there is no money and there is no equipment from the West and especially from United States, the war is over. The solution is in your hand. It's in the hand of, the, of your president. The president one or the future one. But you will solve it. The United States can do it. Nobody else. It's not the solution for the Ukrainians. Of course, it's about Ukrainians. They cannot be neglected. They must be involved. But the real factor is not Ukraine. The real factor is intention of the United States. Right on the mark, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how, do, you, how do you think this ends, Colonel? Or how much longer do you think it, uh, it goes on? Well, I had a prediction that I talked about just amongst myself, you know, and a few friends. I'm seeing a little smile on your face, so I yeah. don't know what's well, coming. <laughs> I, I thought it would be, I thought the mili I thought the war would be over by the fall of 2023. I thought it would be the end. And that was because of resource evaporation, both people, uh, aid, the whole thing. And, and, and also the morale, uh, both of the politicians in Ukraine and the people. And that that's happened. That's happened. But we continue to, um, persist probably because the neocons and the government, the U S government cannot imagine a peace in which they don't lose face. Well, mm. I, that's a tough problem, but it, you know, this is going to sound sexist, but we have to man up. Um, we made mistakes in backing and, and stoking this war and wasting the resources and destroying the country and its culture for many, I mean, for all intents and purposes, Ukraine has got a tough road ahead, no matter what, even if, peace happens today. And we did that. We did that. So we have to own that. And it takes, it takes somebody with uh, courage. It takes, uh, you know, the kind of people that we do not have in our government today. And, and we don't have them in the Pentagon. We don't have them in Washington. We certainly don't have them advising the president and we do not have them in the Congress. So uh, our hands are, you know, we're, it's kind of going to get done for us. Um, but this is our problem, our mistake, our error. And uh, we need to admit it. The war is in my book, over uh, resources, whether even if Biden says no more resources, there are no more resources. Uh, we've pretty much played out everything, both ourselves and the NATO countries there. You know, they've already gotten rid of all their old stuff. We're giving them depleted uranium and cluster bombs. That is stuff from a long time ago that we can't use anywhere else. And that's what we're giving them now, which means we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Uh, the vision for how that over looks like uh, it may be up to us to um, to help them. I don't think they're going to come up with it themselves, but it's happening. It's going to happen to them. Colonel uh, Kwiatkowski, uh, a gifted and eloquent, uh, eloquent statement. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you come back. I can tell from the comments and from the number of people watching. You're a fan fave, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you thanks. so much for having me. It's a great uh, thanks, for your, thanks for your time. Have a great weekend. Okay. Wow. If you like what you saw, and I suspect you did, help us spread the word. Like, subscribe, tell a friend, tell a colleague, tell people you, may, you meet at the supermarket or at cookouts or barbecues, depending upon what you call these things, where you are in the country. In New Jersey, it's a cookout. In Texas, it's a barbecue. But tell your friends about judging freedom. Tell your friends that this is the one place where former military and former intelligence officers can speak with absolute freedom and with no fear and with direct candor. Because what do we do here? We look out for your liberty.